Unit 3 Biology Dissolved Substances Diffusion now, if you remember, we covered diffusion in Unit 2. It's the spreading out of particles of a gas or of any substance in solution from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And the greater the difference in concentration, the faster the rate of diffusion. So in this diagram, we've got the red and blue particles. They're both in higher concentration on the right, so they both spread out. They move to the left. Osmosis. Now, osmosis is a special type of diffusion. It refers to the diffusion of water. And it's the diffusion of water through a partially permeable membrane. And this being biology, the partially permeable membrane we're talking about, of course, is the cell membrane. So water moves from a dilute to a more concentrated solution. So if you have a look at this diagram, we've got water on the left, on the outside of the cell, and in the cytoplasm, those red blobs there, they represent solutes. So, on the outside of the cell, on the left, is more dilute solution. The water is going to move from left to right in towards the cell. Active transport. Now, active transport is different from diffusion and osmosis because active transport is the movement of particles against the concentration gradient. Now, this requires energy from respiration and it means that cells can absorb ions from more dilute solutions. For example, active transport happens in plant roots. They can absorb ions from the soil solution even if the concentration of ions outside the cell is lower than in the cytoplasm. So the plants can always get the ions they need even if the concentration gradient is unfavorable. So this diagram shows active transport in a root hair cell. So the big yellow arrows represent the movement of ions into the cytoplasm. Now you can see from the distribution of the red dots, they're more concentrated inside the cytoplasm than outside. But the plant needs ions. So by active transport, the plant root hair cell can still absorb ions even when it's pulling them against the concentration gradient. So let's talk a little bit about concentration gradients. What it means is it's simply a difference in concentration between one region and another. Now in diffusion, particles move down the concentration gradient from more concentrated to less concentrated. In osmosis, water molecules move down the concentration gradient of water. In other words, from a more dilute or watery to a more concentrated solution. But in active transport, particles move against the concentration gradient. What you must never say in the exam is just along the concentration gradient because that won't get you a mark. You have to be more specific than that. You have to say either down the concentration gradient from high to low or against the concentration gradient from low to high. Exchange surfaces. Now, what do we mean by exchange surfaces? This is any organ or system which is specialized or adapted for exchanging substances with the environment. Now, the bigger in size and the more complex the organism gets, the more and more necessary a specialized exchange surface becomes. Now, exchange is usually by diffusion, osmosis, or active transport. And examples of exchange surfaces are the lungs. They're taking oxygen from the air and releasing CO2. And the small intestine, where soluble food molecules are absorbed. Now, they all tend to have uh, some particular characteristics in common. Exchange surfaces all tend to have a large surface area because this allows more efficient exchange. So you tend to see the surfaces as being very folded. They all tend to be thin because this provides a short diffusion distance between the external environment and the bloodstream. And in animals, the exchange surfaces tend to have 
a very rich blood supply, lots and lots of capillaries. This carries away the absorbed substances very rapidly, so this maintains a high concentration gradient. And breathing systems tend to be ventilated, because refreshing the air also maintains the concentration gradient. So, for example, if we have a closer look at the lungs, the structure of the lungs involves alveoli. We'll have a look at those in a second, the little air sacs. Now, they have a folded surface, and the reason for that is because lots of folds increase the surface area for absorption. They have a rich network of capillaries, the tiny blood vessels, because that will quickly carry away oxygenated blood. That maintains the concentration gradient. The walls of the alveoli are very thin because this provides a short diffusion distance between the air and the bloodstream. And the alveoli are ventilated. We breathe in and out. We refresh the air because this also maintains the concentration gradient. So this shows an alveolus. Alveoli is the plural. So this is at the end of the bronchioles in the lungs. We'll have a look at these in a second. So the air coming into the alveoli has a high concentration of oxygen and it's exchanged with the stale air in the alveoli which have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. The red blood cells circulate around the outside in the capillaries. Now, in the lungs, the red blood cells carrying the pigment haemoglobin combine with the oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Now, oxyhemoglobin is carried away in the bloodstream to the respiring tissues. And here, the oxyhemoglobin breaks down to release oxygen, and then it leaves hemoglobin, which then circulates back to the alveoli. So we're going to be talking about the thorax. This is the chest cavity, the bit that's protected by your rib cage, where the heart and lungs are found. So the thorax is separated from your abdomen, which is where all your gut and intestines and reproductive organs are found, by the diaphragm, which is a sheet of muscle and connective tissue, and it separates the thorax from the abdomen. And we'll see in a minute how the diaphragm, when the muscles contract, the diaphragm can move up and down. Now you can see at the moment the diaphragm, that green highlighted line, is dome shaped. Now when the muscles in the diaphragm contract, that flattens or moves downwards. Let's have a look at how the lungs are ventilated. So what happens in breathing? Now the breathing system takes air in and out of the lungs so that oxygen can diffuse into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide can diffuse out. Now, you must say that it takes air in and out of the lungs. Don't just say in and out of the body. That will lose you a mark. So it takes air in and out of the lungs for the diffusion of gases. So to draw air in or to inhale. Now, you have muscles in between your ribs which contract and relax to move the rib cage up and out. Muscles in the diaphragm contract, and when the muscles in the diaphragm contract, that flattens or lowers the diaphragm. Now this has the effect of lowering the pressure in the thorax, which draws air in. Air moves from high to low pressure. So to force air out of the lungs, Again, the muscles in between the ribs contract and relax, and this moves the rib cage down and in. The diaphragm muscles relax, and that allows the diaphragm to go back to its resting shape, which is the dome shape, so it moves back up when it's relaxed. It's opposite to what you might think. Now, this has the effect of raising pressure in the thorax, which forces air out. Air moves from high to low pressure. Now, I've used this word, ventilation, refreshing the air, changing the air in the lungs, is known as ventilation. And this is essential for maintaining the concentration gradient. The stale air is forced out, fresh air comes in, air that's high in oxygen. Now, 
sometimes our breathing system doesn't work properly. So there are different ways of aiding ventilation. Now, aids to ventilation can use positive pressure. This is where you have a machine with a pipe that's inserted into your trachea. Not very pleasant, so they shove a pipe down your throat and the machine basically pumps air into your lungs. So high pressure from the machine forces air into the lungs and then the pressure is reduced to zero which allows the air in your lungs to then flow out. Now, because there's only a pipe going down into your trachea it means that the rest of your body is able to move so that gives you freedom of movement and it's a reasonably small machine uh, so it's quite portable but the disadvantage of it is the tube can be very uncomfortable and obviously it's quite difficult to eat if you've got a sh tube shoved down your throat. Another way of aiding ventilation is to use a negative pressure system. Now these uh, machines used to be called iron lungs so the patient's body is in a chamber and it's sealed around the person's neck so their head sticks out of the side of the box and there's a tight rubber seal around the person's neck. Now the external pressure around the thorax is reduced because what they'll do is pump the air out of the ventilator. This creates a vacuum. So the pressure around the thorax reduces so the lungs will expand now, outside in the atmosphere, the air at the atmospheric pressure is higher than into your lungs. So air will move from high to low pressure. It will flow into your lungs. Then air is pumped back into the ventilator, which increases the pressure around the outside of the lungs. So the air is forced back out of the lungs. Now this can be quite a lot kinder to the patient than the other system because you don't have this horrible tube shoved down your trachea. And there's less damage caused to the lungs and the airways, especially if this person is in this contraption for a long term. But the disadvantage is if the rest of your body is in this box, it means you can't move around. And the nurses who need to take care of the patient to wash them, to toilet them, all those sorts of things, uh, have difficulty accessing the person's body. It's also quite difficult to get a proper seal around the neck and that may not be too comfortable for the patient. Exchange in the small intestine. Now the interior surface of your small intestine is not a flat smooth tube. It's covered in millions and millions of tiny villi. They're less than a millimeter in height. They're little folds or like finger-like projections. Now these increase the surface area of the small intestine. But not only that, not only do we have villi, but the layer of epithelial cells that covers the villus also has a folded surface. Now this is microscopic. Each epithelial cell has a folded membrane, a folded cell membrane. And these folds are called microvilli. So all of these millions and millions of microvilli further increase the surface area. Each villus is also served by an extensive network of blood capillaries. So let's have a look at these microvilli in the small intestine. Now epithelium, you'll remember from unit two that epithelial tissue is a covering tissue. It covers the inside or outside surfaces of organs. So uh, the inside of our small intestine is covered by a layer of cells that look like this. Not exactly like this, but they've got this folded plasma membrane. And you can see those little folds are called the microvilli. So this greatly increases the surface area for absorption. Now, you'll see also in these epithelial cells, they're jam-packed full of mitochondria. And that's because a lot of the soluble food molecules, which are absorbed from digestion, are absorbed by active transport. Now, as we said a minute ago, active transport requires energy from respiration. And so that's the reason why these cells are packed so full of mitochondria, is to provide the energy for active transport. 
So let's summarise the adaptations of the small intestine. They have many villi and microvilli, and this provides a large surface area for absorption. There are many blood capillaries. Now this quickly removes the absorbed food and this maintains the concentration gradient. The capillaries are near the surface, which provides a short diffusion distance. And the epithelial cells have many mitochondria and this provides the energy for active transport. Okay, so time to answer a few questions just to test yourself on exchange in animals.